You know, have you noticed when you share the gospel with people, there are some who respond positively and their lives are transformed by it, but there are others who hear the same gospel and they refuse to believe in Jesus. What is even more surprising is when you pray for people, they receive an undeniable miracle, and yet they refuse to accept Jesus or even embrace the gospel. I call that spiritual blindness. And here's the definition. If you're wanting to know what, how do you define spiritual blindness, I think it's on the screen, yes. Spiritual blindness is the inability to understand. You reading the word, reading the word, reading the word, but not able to understand. You can't perceive what God is saying to you. You can't grasp or comprehend spiritual truth. It's bouncing off your, your head, or even you're not able to uh, have a revelation of the goodness of God. You know, there are two kinds of blindness. One is physical blindness, and the other is spiritual blindness. The Bible narrates an incident where Jesus heals a man that was born blind, and then the Bible compares the blind man's problem with spiritual blindness. And we see this in the Gospel of John chapter 9. When the religious re rulers heard that Jesus healed a man that was born blind, they found it difficult to accept. So they questioned the man saying, how did you get healed? And he says, I met a man called Jesus. He put mud on my eyes. I washed, my, and after I washed my eyes, I could see. So they asked him, what do you think about this man? And he said, I think he's a prophet. That was his understanding. He received physical sight, but his spiritual sight was still dull. And he thought that Jesus was another prophet. So they decided to ask his parents. And they went to the blind man's parents and asked, is this your son? He says, yeah. They said, yes. Was he born blind? They, he, they said, yes. How did he get healed? And the parents very cleverly said, he's a grown-up man. He can speak for himself, so ask him. And so they went and asked him the second time. But this time, when they questioned him, they said, we know this man you talk about, who's called Jesus, is a sinner. And how can he do this miracle? And this blind man, now seeing, said, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not, but one thing I know I was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. And so he says, I can't figure out whether a sinner, not a sinner, prophet, not a prophet. But what I know, I was born blind, but now I see. Now come with me to the rest of the passage and see the parallel that Jesus uh, uses to define spiritual blindness. We see that in verse 20 to 25. So his parents replied, we know this is our son. Okay, he was born blind. Come down to verse 24. The second time they asked him there in verse 24 and 25. In verse 25, he says, I know one thing, that although I was blind, now I see. So they threw him out of the synagogue. And now here's the dialogue in verse 35. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found the man and said to him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man replied, Who is he? That I may believe in him. Now, he's heard, he's experienced, but yet not believed that he is the Son of Man. Verse 37. You have seen him, he's the one speaking with you. And Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that those who do not see may gain their sight and the ones who see may become blind. I left, left out verse 38. Verse 38 is so important. When Jesus said he's the one speaking to you, 
He said, Lord, and worshipped him. I thought that's a very important aspect in the scripture. It's only when his spiritual eyes were opened, he recognized Jesus, not as a prophet, but as Lord. And the next thing was worship. You can't worship God without a revelation. Worship will be only a sing song if you don't have a revelation about who Christ is or who Jesus is. And here is this man, once his spiritual eyes opened, he became a worshiper. And then Jesus said this, judgment have come to bring into this world so that those who do not see, what is he talking about? Those who are spiritually blind may gain their spiritual sight. And that's the meaning of it. Those who do not see spiritually blind will gain their spiritual sight. And the ones who see may become blind. What did that mean? He says the religious rulers who could see and know truth were blind of who, with the regards to who Jesus was. They couldn't see Jesus as the Messiah. They couldn't see Jesus as the Son of God. And it's actually speaking about religious people. And it's true. Religious people know the law. They know everything about Christianity. They may know everything about the Bible, but not know Jesus. And so Jesus is saying, those who claim to see will actually be blind, spiritually blind. They will not have a revelation of who Jesus is. So in other words, Jesus came to give us spiritual sight to those whose understanding of who God is is dulled and blinded. Now, we all have two sets of eyes. One is to see things physically, and the other is to see things spiritually. Every person. You know, there are 18 million people in India that are born blind with no cure. But God, gave a, but God brought a cure for every individual that was born spiritually blind. And so every person in this world born spiritually blind can receive the remedy of the gospel so that their eyes can be opened and understand who God is. Where did spiritual blindness start? It started in the, in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, God said, Do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for you will surely die. Now, we know that Adam and Eve still lived on for many more years, so it was not referring to physical death. What died when they disobeyed God? Their spiritual connection, their spirit which could perceive God, fellowship with God, died. There was a separation. All death is about separation. There was a separation between Adam and Eve. Their connection with God was, was separated. They were put outside the Garden of Eden. And from that day, Adam and Eve were spiritually blind. They were blind to the truth of God. They were blind to the aspect of what God was saying. But there was something else that happened that we see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. And I want you to look at that verse. It says their eyes were opened. In other words, they were blind spiritually towards God, but their eyes were opened towards evil. And that's why God wanted to protect them from knowing evil, but Satan wanted to introduce them to evil. Hasn't he done a good job in today's world? He's introducing thousands and millions and promoting evil because that's Satan's agenda. God wanted to protect us, but Satan wanted to introduce us to evil. And that's why there's a curiosity in the heart of every man to know evil. Our eyes are open to evil. I want you to look at that verse again. It says, then the eyes of both of them were opened. This was not about their physical eyes. They didn't lose their physical sight. That now it had to be opened. But it was talking about their spiritual eyes that were opened. And they realized what? They were negative. So they sewed fig uh, leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Have you seen a fig leaf? I've seen. I was very really curious to see one. 
I don't know how much you can cover with a fig leaf. You can just barely cover some parts of your body. But anyway, you know, I want to draw your attention to something very significant. When their eyes were open, they couldn't see good, but they could see only evil. They saw the negative things about themselves. All this time they were naked before one another, never felt ashamed, never knew what was the difference between him and her, her and him. They were living together. But once they, their eyes were open to evil, they didn't look at the good in one another. They looked at the faults or the differences between one another. Are you getting what I'm saying this morning? Not only did they look at what was wrong in one another or what was different in one another, they looked at themselves and they said, I yuck, I look like this. How many of you said, looked in the mirror and said that? This is, this is how I look, don't show me the mirror. For some of us, the mirror is not very friendly. Especially when you go to the trial room and start trying on things. I don't know, I, I feel they have a different mirror when it comes to these uh, malls, you know, where you have to have trial. Suddenly you see things that you never see at home. How many of you know, agree with what I'm saying? Can I have some company here? Oh, I have some company here. <laughs> I think that those mirrors enlarge uh, our bodies, I think. But do you know what? We are all still trapped in the way we live life with our spiritual eyes knowing evil rather than good. And so you look at yourself and you're despising yourself. You look at one another and you find the faults of one another more than the good in others. I'm glad you never said amen to that one. You all are very nice people. We don't have the problem here in Adonai. But isn't that a natural tendency? If I gave you a slip of paper and said, write two things about yourself, uh, I think about 90% of you will write two negative things about yourself. Okay, that also you didn't say amen to. So maybe that's wrong. But sin disobedience to God, and Satan wanted us to look at things from a different point of view. So we are blinded. We look at more of what this aspect is in the next, uh, uh, um, probably the next time I preach. But for now, I want you to hold on to the truth. How our eyes are more prone to negative uh, things evil things, ungodly things in other people, our lives, and what's around us. It came as a result of Satan's de deceiving Adam and Eve right there in the Garden of Eden. And how did they choose to cover themselves? They didn't run to God. They chose to cover themselves with fig leaves, and then he ran one way, she ran the other way, covering themselves with fig leaves. And that gave birth to religion. I had to say that. <laughs> religion is man's way to cover their sin. Started there. And that's why when we, get, when we fall into a problem, we are always trying to find our way to come out of the problem. You can say amen for that one. No, that also, no, okay. Lord, uh, help me to score some nice ones. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Our natural tendency is to find our own method to cover our shame, to cover our guilt, to cover our own sin. And that's what the world is doing, which is called religion. But what did God do? God performed the first sacrifice there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21 to 22. The Lord made garments from skin for Adam and Eve and clothed them a far more permanent solution than a fig tree, a fig leaf. He sacrificed an animal, took that skin, and covered their nakedness. And that is God for us. To cover our shame is not what we do, but what God has done for us. 
And that's the gospel. God didn't condemn them, but God restored them. God didn't punish them, but God healed them. God covered their sin. When you come to Christ, the one thing God wants to do for you is to cover your spiritual nakedness, your guilt, your failures, your fault. And that's why the good news is called good because when you come to God, God does not condemn anybody, but he offers them restoration and hope. Somebody shout an amen. That's the good news of the gospel. And the Lord God said, Now that man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not be allowed to stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So he says, one mistake they made. I'm going to stop them from making the second mistake. Eating from the tree of life where they would be permanently in a fallen state, God set an angel there to prevent them from the second mistake. Because God looked at the whole world with hope and restoration. Because everyone that was born after Adam and Eve were born spiritually blind. There is two reasons why people are spiritually blind. One is deceived by Satan. Second, our disobedience. What are the two things? First one. Second. One more time. Second. Same thing happened in the Garden of Eden. Satan deceived Adam and Eve. He's still deceiving many people. Unfortunately, even those who, who believe in Christ are so deceived. And the second, deception always leads you to disobedience. You're so deceived that you think what you know is better than what God knows. And we, you know, we debate with the Word of God. We question the Word of God. Exactly what Adam and Eve did. Question the Word. And so if you're in that place of questioning the Word, don't give in to deception because that's Satan's agenda. Deceive you so that you can question God's Word, walk in disobedience, and you, become, you can become spiritually blind. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in the New Testament, the Bible says the God of this world. The God of this world is not referring to the God in heaven, but it's talking about Satan, the small g, the God of this world. And if you're wondering why there's so much of chaos, confusion, murder, abuse, it's because Satan is known as the God of this world, the atmosphere in which we live. He's God ruling over this whole world. And it says he has an agenda. And his agenda is to blind the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Can you come up here, Shivim, for a moment? Do you have a hanky? No, neither do I. So <laughs> we don't carry hankies. Now, you know, many of us are talking to a lot of blind people. Now you tell Shibin, Shibin, can you see what's on the, on the screen? You know, it's fantastic. You know, the writing is good. This is what the, uh, uh, the Bible is saying. He's blind. He can't see it. He can't read. And that's what spiritual blindness is. You can talk to him and say, the hall is good. The people are nice. They're dressed so well. You know, they're smiling today. And so, but he can't see anything. Why? Well, he's blind. And this is what Satan has done to the whole world. He's blinded the minds of the people so that they will not see hope. Whenever you see there's hope, there's hope where you're going, there's hope what you want to do, there's hope making choices, there's hope Satan robbed the world of choices, of hope. But fortunately, you and I are here today because God intervened, opened our spiritual eyes, and we know truth, and we made the right choice. Someone shout an amen. amen. So go sit near with your wife again. Spiritual blindness is the world's biggest problem. Because without God, 
you can't live a godly life. If you can't see truth, how can we live in truth? Cannot. And that's why we grapple. That's why we are so confused between right and wrong. Because now we must have a revelation. We must grow. Our spiritual eyes must increasingly be open for us to understand and perceive things. What is visions? What is seeing in the spirit? Your spiritual eyes are open. We don't see visions with our natural eyes. We don't see pictures of what God is saying and doing in our lives and other people's lives. We see it by our natural eyes. We see it in our spiritual eyes. I wanted to play a testimony of how the I had a word and someone got healed. I want to play testimonies like that to create an expectancy in the hearts of people. God speaks. And that's why there is a spiritual fight to hold on to truth. There is a spiritual battle to believe against all odds because you are up against the enemy that wants to defy, defy truth. He wants to rattle you, shake you from being anchored in truth. He did it for Adam and Eve, and he's doing it for everyone here today. Everyone in the world is challenged when it comes to, to their faith in God. What God did for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, He now did for us through His Son, Jesus. And I want you to look at this familiar passage and highlight the last part, which we don't talk much about. Come with me to Luke chapter 4, verse 18. See, the gospel is the remedy for people to, to know God. When you believe the gospel, it's the remedy, God's remedy. So Jesus came to proclaim the good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom or release to those who are captives, and the, can you all read it after me? Regaining of sight to the blind and to set free those who are oppressed. Can we say that again? And the regaining of sight to the blind and to set free those who are oppressed. What is that regaining a sight? God looked at the world not only in a place of bondage, but also spiritually blind. And he says, I've come to preach the gospel, bring healing to the brokenhearted, set captives free, and to open those eyes which are spiritually blind. And then it says, set free those who are oppressed. The minute you see Christ, you're free from oppression. The more you get to see what Jesus is, the more you get to understand what he did for you, the more free you will walk and live your life. It's all tied up with your spiritual sight. The spiritual sight is called revelation. You understand things that's not written in a book. You understand things that come from the Spirit of God. And so if you heard me say, uh, you know, talk about the daily bread, you know, you forgive me, but I still hold on to my opinion that daily bread is what someone ate and someone uh, chewed nicely and put it there, and you're mm, nice, nice. Your daily bread shouldn't come from a book. Your daily bread must come from God. He is the source of all truth. He is the one that gives revelation. Take the word, pray the word, believe the word, and God will open your spiritual eyes. You will have revelation. You will see things that hardly anyone else has seen. How many of you experience this? We read the Bible over and over again. The third time, fourth time, every time you read it, there's something new. Put your hand up. Why? Because the more you read the word, the more God reveals it to you. And that's why the Bible is the most read book in the world. It's the most read book. That's the only book you can read it a thousand times and still not get bored of it. There's something new to discover. There's something new and fresh that God wants to speak to you. It's alive. It's active. In John chapter 3, verse 3, here was a religious man called Nicodemus. 
you know, Pharisee kept all the laws. He was very righteous in his own way, in his own uh, abiding by the law. And he sneaks up uh, uh, to get in touch with Jesus at night so nobody can uh, know that he's a religious ruler talking to Jesus because it was an offense at that time. You talking to Jesus, we are religious rulers, we got the truth. That's why Jesus says those are religious. He came to make them blind. <laughs> anyway. What did Jesus tell, tell him? Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he will not. What seed that meant? He didn't talk about seeing with the natural eyes. He says, you will never be able to see with your spiritual eyes the kingdom. I'm going to give you the remedy, at least part of the remedy by the end of this message. You heard of people when they read the Bible, they fall asleep? You heard? Don't put your hand up here. You can come for prayer after the meeting. And so now they read the Bible to sleep. This becomes a remedy. You know, wow, I can't get sleep. I remember one guy, so honest he was with me. He says, you know, I can't sleep during the week, but when I come on Sunday morning, I can sleep so well. So I sit at the back and I sleep, and I said, praise God, at least something he gets from Sunday morning. <laughs> he finds his rest uh, during a service. <laughs> Nicodemus knew Jesus as a great teacher, didn't understand him as the son of man or the son of God. And then Jesus goes on to say, unless you're born of water and the spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Uh, I just like to highlight this. Unless you see, you'll never be able to enter. To the extent you see is to the extent you will walk into the goodness of God or the truth and the freedom that God has for you. It starts with seeing. The disciples asked Jesus a very valid question in Matthew chapter 13, verse 10 to 16. Why do you speak to people in parables? Why are you always, you know, making it a bit complicated? Why are you speaking to the big crowd in parables? And this is Jesus' answer. Verse 11. And Jesus replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, not to them. Interesting. He says the knowledge and the secrets of the kingdom are meant for you, not for the crowd. The crowd is just coming, but it's meant for you. Then he goes on to say, whoever has will be given more. Whoever has a revelation will be given more. And they will have an abundance because when you see things, you walk into it. Whoever does not have, you don't have a revelation. Even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because those who have spiritual sight will keep seeing and still keep walking in the abundance of what I have for them. But those who claim to see, even what they have will be taken away. Those seeing, they do not see. Those hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. And Isaiah saw what was coming and he prophesied it. Jesus picks it up and he says, there is going to be a time where people will keep reading, keep reading and not understand. They will keep seeing, they will keep hearing, but never being able to perceive. You know, if you want to have a revelation of God's word, you need to hear a message more than once. 
but we end the service, we tell the person, lovely message, okay message, okay, nice message, chalta hai, and then we carry on. Lay hold of truth. That's why Jesus instructed his disciples. When you hold on to truth, then you will be my disciples, and then the truth will set you free. Holding on to truth. Adam and Eve didn't hold on to truth. They allowed deception to rob them from truth. He goes on to say, For this people's heart have become calloused or dull, that they hardly hear with their ears. What ears is he talking about? Not the physical ears. They're listening with their physical ears, but can't understand what God is saying. Then he said, they, uh, and they close their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts. So I want to make this clear, that all of us have spiritual eyes. You know, when a child is born, the child has a limited vision. Am I right? But he's not blind. The child can see. It can see a little. But he can't discern colors because he's young. But as he grows, he understands colors. He begins to recognize people. He begins to understand things more. Why? Because as the child is growing, his eyes are developing, and he can, become, he can see things more clearly than what he saw when he was born. In the same way, when you are born again, you can see things, but you can't see it clearly. And that's why not only it's true in our spiritual life, in our physical life, it's true for our spiritual lives. As we mature in God, as we lay hold of the Word, walk in obedience, understand His Word, our spiritual eyes are developing. They're developing. So as you grow in your spiritual uh, life, you're, you'll be able to see things, understand things, perceive things before, more than what you could when you were a young Christian. Am I right in saying that? What I see this year is more than what I saw last year. Why? Because our, our spiritual eyes are constantly developing. Till the point we say, I can see him high and lifted up. He is king of kings and he is lord of lords. You know it because your spiritual eyes have been developed. I wish there's a clinic. Come test your spiritual eyes to see how much you can see. Vision. Okay, you need this treatment. You need one chapter a day and you need to pray and you need to get, get down. Call the guns and God, open my spiritual eyes. You come next. <laughs> Unfortunately. Charles is saying, start one. Okay. Look at what this verse is saying. Look at what Jesus is saying. Otherwise, you know, if they're, in other words, if they could see and hear spiritually, then he says they will understand with their heart and their spirit and turn, repent, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because, you see, because they see and your ears because they hear. We are blessed. We are happy people. The word blessed means happy. What does the word blessed mean? happy. He says, blessed are you because you have eyes and you can see things that the others don't see. You know, the world may mock our faith in Christ. Why? They don't see it. They don't see it. They don't want to see it. Religion has blinded their eyes. But blessed are we, Jesus is saying, blessed are we, not because we got a promotion, Blessed are we not because we found a partner. Blessed are we not because we got a hike in pay. He says, blessed are we because we can see with our spiritual eyes, hear with our hear, uh, spiritual ears. It brings us not only a place of healing, it brings us to a place of joy and happiness. You see. You see. This is my take. The more you become a Christian, the less discouraged you become. 
the more you, your spiritual eyes are open, the less you walk in defeat. You're sleeping like that or you're saying yes? <laughs> I have to check, you know. Someone is just shaking. I said, which one? You're sleeping? You, nowadays, deception has gone to such a level with eyes open, they can sleep. You know, how to convince you all? I don't know whether you need even convincing, but there's a joy about knowing God. And when you start the day with looking at God, more than before you look at your wife or anyone, look at God. You will keep your joy till the end of the day. <laughs> My wife is very good, okay? She's very happy. <laughs> but I'm just saying this, you know. Before you look at anyone, you look at God. You get God's perspective. Even in the early days of our marriage, when I found Andrew irritated, that's the only time I'll ask you, did you spend time with God today? It's showing. <laughs> early days, okay. You know, it's so obvious when we're not in that place of looking and worshiping God and enjoying God. Because what you receive from God, you, you give to others. It overflows from you. Automatically, you start being loving, you become kind, you become gracious. Why? Because hey, you're, spiritual. you're looking at the one. You're looking at the source. You're looking at who he is. When Saul had an encounter with God on the road of Damascus, he was a religious ruler, zealous for the kingdom, persecuting Christians, when God met him, his spiritual eyes opened. And God gave him a mandate. You know what his mandate was? Not a date with a man, okay? Um, <laughs> sorry, the side of me is coming out this morning. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is what the Lord said to him in in verse 17, Acts 26, to open their eyes, spiritually that is, open their spiritual eyes, go and preach the gospel so that their eyes will be opened so that they will turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sin and share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That was his goal. You share the gospel that's what God told Saul or told, told Paul. Go preach the gospel so that their spiritual eyes will be opened. And when it's opened, then they will turn from darkness to light. And then they will receive forgiveness and the blessing that there is. You see, uh, there's a difference when you see things, you, you partake of it. When someone says, open your mouth and put something in your mouth, it doesn't go down well. And God wants us to have an ability to see things so we lay hold of it. We are partaking of it. We are drawing from it because we can see it. Paul understood the importance of what it meant for people's eyes to be open spiritually. That he prayed for the church constantly so that their spiritual eyes will be open. And I've been praying this for you. I was reminded of what I did in my early days of a Christ my Christian life. And I want you to follow me or even make a note of this. This is, a, this is the prayer that Paul prayed for the church. And if he prayed for the church... We can pray it for ourselves. Isn't that right? And it's good to take some of these prayers that Paul prayed because Paul is not here. Where you say, Lord, he's not praying. I don't know whether the pastor is praying so much for me, but I can pray that prayer. I'm praying, okay? But you know what? It's, it's you own it when you pray it yourself. You have faith for what you pray for. Now let's listen to what the prayer is all about. In Ephesians chapter 1, 15 to 18. He says, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, they were believers. 
They're not unbelievers. They're believers. He says, I have never stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Never stop. He constantly prayed for the church. He says in verse 17, I keep asking, continue tense, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Complete it, please. So that, so that, one more time, loudly, so that, but aren't they believers? Aren't they believers? Aren't they there in the church? Yes. But you know what? They could see as baby Christians. God, Paul is praying, God, fill them with wisdom and revelation that we would know him. That means we, it's a journey of knowing God, and God is so vast with regards to who he is that it will take a lifetime to discover, to discover every aspect of the goodness of God. And he's praying for wisdom and a spirit of revelation. Can you see revelation there? He says, I'm praying that they would know you better. I pray that the eyes of their heart, where's your eyes of your heart? Show me where's your eyes of your heart. Don't put your hand here and say, Lord, open my eyes. You're not blind. Your spiritual eyes are here. Where's your spiritual eyes? It's the heart. Your heart is not, uh, this is your physical heart. The heart, the, the center aspect of who you are, the most important aspect of you is your spirit being. Your spirit is here. And you have eyes here, you have eyes here. We're the only privileged people to have here and your eyes. <laughs> and therefore, you should not be making, we should not be making so many mistakes in our life. Make wrong judgments. Someone gives you a rose, you fall for it. Look beyond the rose and see who he is. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God gave you two sets of eyes so that you'll see before you go and not fall in a ditch. Some Christians, I mean, their decision making is pits here. I mean, yeah, let me. It's terrible. Sometimes I think even an unbeliever won't make decisions like that. But anyway, we no, we all good people, okay. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you and the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. How do you get the inheritance? You see it and you walk in it. What you see is what you receive. You know why the enemy is promoting pornography so much? He wants to kill the ability to see things spiritually. He wants to blind you so much that you can't see God, you can't see truth. All you could see is evil, 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 evil. And that's why he's, he's advertising to the, to the maximum to distort our vision physically and spiritually so that we can't see beyond and understand what God is saying and doing in our lives. You know, let's learn from Adam and Eve's mistake. Let's not give in to these things because Satan's agenda is to rob you from the truth of who God is and the freedom that God brings into our lives. And if you want to walk in the inheritance that God has given to us, it will start with you praying, God, help me, Lord. Open in my eyes of my understanding. Enlighten me, Lord. Fill me with wisdom. Fill me with understanding that I would know you, Lord. You know what I would do in my Christian life, early Christian days? I would open the Bible. There was no electronic devices. I would open my Bible, turn to Ephesians 1, and I will lay my hands on it, and I will pray that prayer, and I say, God, thank you, Lord. I believe, Lord. You're going to give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation that I may know the hope of my calling, that I would know the glorious riches, riches uh, uh, that you have as my inheritance. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And I begin to worship God, pray in other tongues, and believe God. S 
Cemeteries will give you knowledge. Did they say cemeteries? I mean, se seminaries will give you knowledge. <laughs> Revelation comes from God. In Dehradun, this guy's pastor had to lead him to Christ. He's pastoring a church. Because he went to cemetery. Sorry, the seminary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you want your children to be born again? You know, instead of shouting at your partner, start praying for your partners. Lord, open their spiritual eyes. Start praying for your kids. Because my concern is the next generation. You, have had, you had a revelation of Christ. You're teaching them a form of godliness. And they can grow up. And this pastor grew up in a Christian home and he thought he was a Christian. You can't be a Christian because you're born a Christian home. Billy Graham said this, you're not a car just because you're born in a garage. Being born in a garage doesn't make you a car. Being born in a Christian home doesn't make you a Christian. You need to have a revelation of Christ. You need to accept him personally. God has no grandchildren. Did you know that? No grandchildren. Say, I'm a, I'm a believer so my child will be. No proxy. Everyone must come to a revelation and understanding of who Christ is, Christ, the revelation of who he is, and accept Christ personally. However good or bad he is, good, he can go Pharisee type, bad, salt type, or whichever type. But you know what? Pray for your kids. Pray for your kids. Pray for yourself. Pray for the people that you're witnessing to. Pray for the people around. Pray for one another in the church that we will be a people that will be filled with the wisdom and the knowledge of God that we may know him. And then we make the worshipers lead, worship leader's job easy. He just sings a song and we're lifted hands, with lifted hands, with mouth open, and we're just worshiping God because we worship him from who we see rather than what the lyrics of the song say.